Hello, I'm Larry Wilson. This is webinar number nine, discussing my book, Jesus's Final Victory. Today's presentation will be a discussion on Prophecy 7. If you don't have a copy of my book, Jesus's Final Victory, or any other book that I have written, you can freely download them at wakeup.org. Wake Up is hyphenated www.wake-up.org. Go to that website and click on the red button on the left side of the screen called Topical Studies, and there you can see all of the books and download them for free that I have written. The more you know about apocalyptic prophecy, the more you will benefit from it. So today, in the interest of making the best use of our time, I'm going to assume that you have already read Prophecy 7. I'm going to focus in on the first three verses of this prophecy, where four angels are seen holding back the four winds. Now, if you want to study further into the topic of the 144,000, which are mentioned in this prophecy, Please go to the website I just mentioned earlier and download the article on the 144,000. I have a rather comprehensive study on this interesting topic, and I hope that you will take advantage of it. Just click on the red Topical Studies button at wakeup.org. Remember, wakeup is hyphenated. As you might expect, Prophecy 7 speaks volumes with very few words. To properly understand this prophecy, there are several things that a person needs to first know about. Let's go to the computer screen and let's notice what these things are. First, you need a basic understanding of Revelation's seven trumpets and seven bowls. This will become apparent as today's study unfolds. You also need to understand the difference between God's redemptive and destructive judgments. God's judgments accomplishes two different objectives depending on what God wants to do. And of course, you need to know something about the full cup principle. I know this sounds crazy, but when it comes to apocalyptic prophecy, God designed it in such a way that you have to understand the whole thing before you can understand anything. <laughs> there are so many pieces, and they align with each other, and when viewed as a whole, one harmonious picture unfolds. And it is truly an interesting and an amazing mosaic to see. When you see all these pieces aligning with each other to create one harmonious story, it's truly, truly amazing. So to begin on Prophecy 7, I want you to consider the following statement. We need to unravel something that confuses a lot of people before we get started today. The Bible speaks about three types of wrath. Three types of wrath. Many people do not know this, and they have been misled as a result. People who are advocates of the pre-tribulation rapture have been led to believe that God's children will es escape the great tribulation because 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and Romans 5.9 indicate that God's children will escape God's wrath. Unfortunately, these two texts do not apply to the Great Tribulation, even though I wish they did. Rather, these two texts speak about God's children escaping the penalty for sin. That is, the second death, not the Great Tribulation. 
Watch how this unfolds. Let's examine the three types of wrath defined in the Bible. The first type of wrath might be understood as the fruit or the consequences that comes from wrongdoing. In other words, whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. If we violate a physical or moral law, we will suffer wrath, the consequences of breaking that law. You cannot escape the rule that whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. This is expressed, you know, in the book of Galatians. Okay, so the second type of wrath is defined in the Bible as the penalty for sin. Now, remember, there's a difference between the consequences of breaking the law and the penalty for breaking the law. If you break the law, and you steal somebody's hubcaps, and you get caught, the consequences of breaking the law is one thing, but the penalty is another. What is the penalty for sin? The penalty for sin is death by execution. Now, if you remember from last month's presentation, no one but Jesus has yet suffered the penalty for sin. You see, the penalty for sin, that is the second death, will only be imposed on the wicked at the end of the thousand years. So the penalty for sin, no one but Jesus has experienced the second death. So the second type of wrath that we've looked at is the penalty for sin. The first kind of wrath we looked at is the consequence for wrongdoing. There are consequences for committing adultery. There are consequences for stealing. There are consequences for lying. Now, the third type of wrath defined in the Bible is God's anger, which occurs through redemptive and or destructive judgments. For example, the flood in Noah's day and the fire that burned up Sodom and Gomorrah were destructive judgments. Destructive judgments. So we see in the Bible three types of wrath and understanding the unique properties of each type is very important. So let's review it one more time so that we have them all straight. There is wrath that comes as the consequence or the fruit of doing evil. You, you commit murder, there's going to be a consequence for that. If you commit sin, there's going to be a penalty for that. And the penalty for sin is death by execution at the end of the thousand years. And then the third type of wrath described in the Bible is when God's anger is aroused and he sends redemptive and or destructive judgments. Now, you need to understand these three types of wrath because Prophecy 7 actually is focused on and concerns the third type of wrath, God's redemptive and destructive judgment. Keep in mind that Prophecy 7 is not just a local prophecy concerning the United States, which only has 5% of the world's population. The whole world is involved in Revelation's story, and the Bible predicts that God's wrath is coming upon the whole world. Remember this text in Revelation 3.10? This is where Jesus is speaking, you know, to the seven churches. And he speaks tenderly to the church at Philadelphia. And he says, since you, that is the church in Philadelphia, 
have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you during the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now, I know that the translation that I'm reading from, the NIV, as well as the King James Version, uses the preposition from. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world. Well, the problem here is that the preposition from is also the same word for the preposition during. And so depending on what the translators would want you to think, you might get a slightly different view if you use the word from than the word during. But the word during makes the most sense for one simple reason. It is inclusive. I'm going to keep you during the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world. How can it come upon the whole world if the whole world is not included? From does not fit. And it doesn't fit with other scriptures that speak about this topic. But it's very clear that Jesus is indicating that an hour of trial is coming upon the whole world. And for what purpose? To test those who live on the earth. Now, what about this hour of trial? What, what constitutes, what causes, what, what does the hour of trial consist of? Remember the words of Gabriel when he spoke to Daniel? Gabriel said to Daniel, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. When does the time of wrath occur? The vision concerns the appointed time of the end. So the time of wrath and the appointed time of the end are the same time period, the Great Tribulation. And Gabriel's vision, Gabriel's words, excuse me, Gabriel's words to Daniel, I'm going to tell you what will ha happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end, is pointing to a moment in time that has not yet happened. Consider this outline. Here we have this little X here represents 1994. And here we are 18 years later, living in the year 2012. So, the Y represents 2012. And what the Bible is trying to teach us, the book of Revelation and prophecy 7, 8, 9, and 10, all together are trying to show us is that a time of wrath is coming upon the earth. And this wrath will consist of seven trumpets and seven bowls, 14 events. Now, the seven trumpets will be redemptive wrath, and the seven bowls will be destructive wrath. And the, together, this time of wrath lasts 1,335 days. When you add 1,265 plus 70, you have 1,335 days. This is the big picture of what the Bible is trying to teach us. And we're going to see in today's lesson that God has had angels on hold for the past 18 years, waiting for the appointed time to arrive so that when the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are completed, 6,000 years of sin are also completed. Okay? 
How much longer this little interval of waiting will be, I do not know. But it appears to me it can't be very long. At this point, we're going to review a few things that were covered in previous webinars because we will build on some of these things today. For example, we know from previous studies that the third seal was broken in 1844 and therefore the next seal to open on the book of life will be the fourth seal. Now what happens when the fourth seal is broken open? Let's read Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. Now John is reporting, and the fourth living creature invites John to come and watch what he must do. Verse 8, John says, I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades which is the Greek word for the grave, the grave was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill. When the fourth seal is broken open, a fourth of the earth's population is going to die by one of these four judgments, sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. That means 25% of 7 billion people are about to perish. That's 1.75 billion people. Now, you must remember that the United States only has 350 million people. This is almost seven times the number of people in the United States. 1.75 billion people are about to perish and the world, including a billion Christians, I'm adding together Catholics and Protestants, the world and, and most Christians have no idea that this great manifestation of God's wrath is about to occur. How tragic. How sad. And, and, and what does God say about those who should be warning his people? What does God say to the watchmen on the wall? What does God say to the pastors and the priests and, the, and those who, who claim to speak for him when they are negligent uh, in warning and uh, telling the people what God is about to do? Well, it sounds like the days of Noah to me. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, the people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day, Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I have a little surprise for you. Yes, a real surprise. The coming of Jesus is not a one-day event. The coming of Jesus is a 1,335-day event. A parade of apocalyptic events will occur over a period of 1,335 days 
and Jesus shows up at the end of this parade of events. Going back to the words that Jesus spoke, and they knew nothing about what would happen. Noah had preached 120 years, but the people had shut him out. They had no idea that the time had come until the flood came and took them all away, and that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We're not talking about on that one day when Jesus takes the, resurrects the dead and gathers up the living to take them to the holy city. That's not what he's speaking about. He's speaking about the fact that people will be going about their ordinary life, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, the usual course of life, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And that's how it will be when the coming of the Son of Man begins. And there will be a 1,335-day parade of apocalyptic events that will culminate with the physical appearing of Jesus. Now, I just said a minute ago, because the third seal was broken in 1844, the breaking of the fourth seal comes next. And when the fourth seal is broken open, a fourth of Earth's population will perish. So what is the significance of sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts? What do they, how are they used to kill a fourth of mankind? Well, let's go to the Bible and see. Notice what the Lord said to Ezekiel during the Babylonian captivity. I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 14, starting at verse 12. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man. If a country, now God is speaking to Ezekiel, not about Israel, who has been unfaithful. Remember, when Ezekiel uh, receives this vision, Ezekiel is in Babylon because of the Lord's anger with Jerusalem and with Israel. So, as the Lord begins this little conversation with Ezekiel, the Lord is not talking about Israel at this point. He's talking about any country, any nation that he has uh, set up. Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand. Now, notice God says, I stretch out my hand to cut off its food supply and send famine. Now, here's one of the four. Remember, sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts? And I send famine upon it and kill, and kill its men and their animals. Even if these three men, the heroes of the Old Testament, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in that country, they could save only themselves. By their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. Or, if I send wild beasts through that country, and they leave it childless, and it becomes desolate so that no one can pass through it because of the beasts. Now, wild beasts can be snakes, can be bears, lions, uh, Africanized uh, killer bees. <laughs> God can, can call a, a swarm of locusts. Wild beasts can include anything that the Lord wishes to use to make a country desolate. If I send wild beasts to that country as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, even if these three men were in it, that's Noah, Daniel, and Job, they could not save their own sons or daughters. They alone would be saved 
but the land would be desolate. It's an interesting point here. Parents cannot save their own sons or daughters. Okay, God says in verse 17, Or what if that country is unfaithful to me, and I bring a sword against that country and say, Let the sword pass throughout the land, and I kill its men and their animals. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, even if these three men were in it, they could not save their own sons or daughters. They alone would be saved. Finally, in verse 19, the Lord says to Ezekiel, Or if I send a plague. Now, who is taking responsibility for sending famine, wild beasts, sword into this unfaithful country? The Lord is talking about his actions. Many people say, oh, the Lord, he will not harm. He will not send evil. He will not bring plague or sword or famine. Well, people who say such things have not read the Bible. Because the Lord clearly says, if I send a plague into that land and pour out my wrath upon it through bloodshed, killing its men and their animals, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. They would save only themselves. By their righteousness. Okay, now that the Lord has spoken to Ezekiel about a pagan country who is unfaithful to him, watch what happens in this next verse. For this is what the sovereign Lord says to Israel. Now, I, you see it's in brackets. I have inserted my words because I want you to get the implication of what God is saying. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says to Israel. If in my wrath I am willing to punish a pagan country that sins against me, how much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem those who should have known better, those who knew the difference between right and wrong, how much worse will it be when I send against my elect, my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plague, for what purpose? To kill its men and their animals. Did you notice that God calls his wrath, describes his wrath as four judgments? And these four judgments come in the form of sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. Did you notice that? Let me back up here and show you one more time. In verse 19, Or if I send a plague into that land and pour out my wrath upon it. So we see that God is talking about his wrath in sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. And then we see how much worse will it be for those who knew better. When, he sent, when I sinned against them, what does God call sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts? He calls them my four dreadful judgments. And what is the purpose of God's four judgments? To kill men and animals. Okay, now that you understand what God's wrath is all about, in terms of these four judgments. Let's go back and look at the fourth seal a little closer. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. The uh, Greek word for pale, I believe I mentioned last month, is green. And um, the idea here is that this is a green horse. This is a, a horse that's difficult to ride. 
and its writer was named Death, and the grave, Hades, was following close behind him, and they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill with what? God's wrath is poured out. His four dreadful judgments are poured out on mankind. The whole world, the entire earth. Let's, uh, let's, let's connect the dots. I hope you can see three things here, three dots. Number one, God's wrath consists of four deadly judgments. Sword, famine, plague, and wild beast. Okay, that's simple. Number two, God sends his judgments upon those who don't know him as well as those who claim to know him. He used them on Jerusalem, and he used them on the other countries. In fact, God has been using sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts the entire duration of of man, uh, sinful man. God uses, and this is a third point, sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts to punish nations when they fill up their cup of sin. This is why the fourth seal is next for the whole world. He's going to punish the whole world because every nation, every nation has filled up their cup of sin. Every nation. This brings us to a policy which God consistently follows. It is a policy that is easy to discover in the Bible, and I call this policy the full cup, the full cup principle. In a sentence, the full cup principle is this. When a group of people becomes so rebellious that extended mercy has no redeeming effect, God responds with one or more of his four deadly judgments. When a group of people becomes so rebellious that extended mercy does nothing, God responds. Now, a group of people can be the whole world, as in Noah's day. It can be a city, as in Sodom, Gomorrah, or Jerusalem. It can be a country, such as Israel, Egypt, or Assyria. Or it can be an empire. A group of people can be an empire, such as Rome, Grecia, or Babylon. When God sees a group of people, become so rebellious that extended mercy produces no redeeming effect, he sends deadly judgment. The full cup principle is a standing policy that God uses for managing groups of people. Depending on the situation, God may send redemptive destruction so that if possible, some will repent and reform their ways. Or if he knows that it is hopeless, as in Noah's day, he just may send total destruction, get it over with. Sometimes God sends a warning, as in Noah's day and in Nineveh's day. Remember Jonah went and preached? Noah preached 120 years. In, Nin in Jonah's case, Nineveh did repent. And Nineveh's destruction was delayed 160 years. In Noah's day, no one repented and the world was destroyed. You may also recall that God sent numerous warnings to Israel during the century prior to Nebuchadnezzar's capture of Jerusalem. God sent numerous prophets to warn Israel of impending doom but it had no effect on Israel. 
On other occasions, God does not send a specific red flashing light and a noisy buzzer. Uh, I'm, what I mean here is a warning. For example, there is no indication in the Bible that God sent an alarm to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moreover, God did not send a flashing red light and a noisy buzzer to warn Israel before Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Yes, 40 years earlier, Jesus predicted the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem. He said, you know, about the temple complex, not one stone would be left upon another. So there was knowledge, yes, there was knowledge that Jerusalem would be destroyed at some point in the future. But that knowledge was limited to those who believed in Jesus, who knew about the words of Jesus. And they were prepared for the brief opportunity that occurred when Nero died, when Vespasian lifted the siege and returned to Rome because of Nero's death. They escaped and, 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 and did not die the following year when Titus came back and destroyed the city. So God uses his four judgments, sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts in two ways. He uses them in a punitive way, that means punishment, seeking to bring about repentance and reformation if possible, or he may use his four deadly judgments in a totally destructive way to eliminate the problem. The book of Revelation contains information that is critically important right now, today. The book of Revelation is the flashing red light, and the noisy buzzer. <laughs> the book of Revelation is warning the whole world through knowledge that the fourth seal is about to be broken open. But who cares? Who knows? Who is concerned? There will not be a general warning to the world at large of God's coming wrath. Even if there was a general warning, who would believe it? When you realize that Christianity only represents less than 25% of the world's population, who's going to believe such a warning? Would a large number of people repent and abandon their evil ways if they heard such a warning? Or do you think many people are so spiritually dead or numb that they cannot be awakened? The book of Revelation teaches that God is going to mercifully punish the whole world with seven trumpets and then mercilessly destroy the whole world with seven bowls. A time of mercy will be seen during the seven trumpets and a time without mercy during the seven bowls. Why is this important for you to know? Well, today, at this very hour, look at your watch. Four angels, described in Revelation 7, are holding back God's wrath. As I count it, They've been waiting since the spring of 1994. So far, we have been living in an 18 and a half year delay. What is God waiting on? The answer is rather simple. Gabriel spoke the answer when he talked to Daniel 2,600 years ago. The time of wrath occurs at the appointed time. When the appointed time arrives, Jesus will select and seal 144,000 people. When they're ready to go, when they're ready to do the work that Jesus wants them to do, corporate mercy will end, 
The censer will be cast down at the altar of incense. The fourth seal will be broken, and the four angels having the first four trumpets will be released to harm earth. God's angels are armed and ready. They're locked and loaded, waiting for the six words that will release them to punish a planet in rebellion. And these six words are found in Revelation 10.6. Jesus is going to utter this command. At the appointed time, there will be no more delay. I assume that you already know something about the seven trumpets of Revelation because you have my book. <laughs> so I'm going to jump forward into Prophecy 8 for just a moment. The first four trumpet judgments will fall on notably wicked places. And the last three trumpet judgments will fall on desperately wicked people. You need to know that. Notably wicked places, the first four trumpets, and desperately wicked people, the last three trumpets. The censer will be cast down, the fourth seal will be broken, and the seven trumpets will begin when Jesus says there will be no more delay. So here's the story according to the four rules of interpretation that I use. Step one, we're reading now from the Bible. Revelation 8, 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. I believe this happened for reasons outside of today's study, but you can discover them in Appendix A if you want to jump ahead. I believe this happened in the spring of 1994. I believe the seven angels were given the seven trumpets in the spring of 1994 because the full cup had been reached. God's patience with the world had come to an end. But it was not yet the appointed time for God's wrath. So, what happens? John writes in Revelation 7.1, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. And then I heard another angel, saw another angel coming up from the east having the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels, notice, who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Step number three. When the time, appointed time, arrives, John says, Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, There will be no more delay. Step number four, when the Lamb opened the fourth seal, you know what happens. Out of heaven's temple comes a rider named Death on a pale horse, and the grave is following close behind, and they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And then this is how it happened. The sensors cast down, flashes of lightning, a global earthquake, and then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. And you know what is the result? There comes fire and hail mixed with blood, hurled down upon the earth, and a third of the land, a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And then the second angel sounded his trumpet in something like a huge mountain, a third of the sea turned into blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Well, we're going to have to take a little intermission, and when we come back, I'm going to show you in a little chart that I've made uh, what I think you will 
um, appreciate how all of this connects together with such intricate harmony in the book of Revelation. So let's take a short intermission and we'll be right back after this. <music> 